Hello and welcome to the Ocean Impact Podcast. In this episode, we caught up with Laura Wells, who is a model, presenter and environmentalist. Laura and I go way back. In fact, I helped introduce her into the Australian environmental landscape in about 2012-2013. Now, the circumstances surrounding this podcast were particularly interesting. Laura had just spent 19 days sailing across the South Pacific Ocean with the X Expedition crew, an all-female, round-the-world sailing adventure studying plastic pollution, only to have the coronavirus pandemic unfold while they were at sea. Unfortunately, they had to race back to Tahiti, and Laura was then sent to Australia for 14 days quarantine in a hotel room. I think you'll agree that Laura's spirits are surprisingly high given the circumstances. Thanks so much for your time, Laura. I really hope everyone enjoys this episode. And if you do, please write a review and share it widely. Thanks for tuning in. Okay, really pleased to have on the podcast today, Laura Wells, an old friend and a fantastic advocate for the planet. Uh, Laura, how are you going? I'm good, considering where I am. (laughs) Yeah, we better start there because uh, we are in a peculiar time in in, in history. Uh, It's 10th of April 2020, and many people's lives have been disrupted in a huge way. But I think your predicament is particularly interesting. Would you like to give us a bit of a snapshot of of where you are and why? Yeah, so currently I am in mandatory hotel quarantine in Sydney. I've been here for uh, 11 days now, um, slowly descending into madness. Uh, (laughs) It's actually been okay, uh, but I can't leave my room or open any windows. Um, so it was a rude kind of shock to come back to Australia after such an amazing trip that I've been on, spending a lot of time outdoors to be confined to a, a very small room um, and not see or talk to anyone face to face. So this is getting to the bottom of it. So obviously many people coming back into Australia with the rules uh, put in place did have to go into this mandatory hotel quarantine but you didn't just come from any old holiday or moving back from living abroad. Tell us where you came from and the circumstances that led to you being in uh, in this quarantine situation. Yeah, so I have been away with X Expedition, which is round the world, uh, all female sailing trip to study microplastics in essentially every single ocean in the world. Uh, So I was on leg eight of that and I flew over to Easter Island, to Rapa Nui, and we were sailing from Rapa Nui all the way to Tahiti. So we had a 24-day voyage ahead of us, um, conducting a lot of science along the way. And whilst we were on board, we kind of got word that the world had gone crazy (laughs) and everyone was shutting their borders so for us it meant that we really needed to try and get to French Polynesia as fast as possible um, to ensure that we could enter a country on the boat and what that would mean for us Um, and so our trip got cut short by around five days of sailing like we were supposed to stop at Pitcairn Island and Henderson Island and we couldn't do that essentially because Uh, French Polynesian government just said to us, look, you've got to get here or um, you can't come in. And what that meant for us was if we couldn't get in there, we couldn't actually go anywhere because everywhere else had closed their borders too and French Polynesia were the last. So it would have meant that the 14 women on board would have been stuck essentially on the high seas um, with around two months' worth of food, no fuel and uh, very little water. (laughs) So uh, that, that was the predicament we were in. So we as fast as we could with the sailing boat, got to Tahiti. It really just goes to show how rapidly the the world has been transformed as a result of this. So jumping on that vessel in in Rapa Nui, and I was obviously following you on your social channels throughout this journey, there was really no thought or concern that this this would be looming over the horizon? Uh, Not really. Like we, We were taking precautions. So we We knew that French Polynesia were bringing in uh, some different restrictions in terms of if you were going to French Polynesia, you had to have a medical certificate um, dated five days before your arrival. So, um, but nothing else, like no, no one had, no one had brought in any travel restrictions as such yet. So it was fine for us to leave. So we went, 
went and saw a doctor in Rapa Nui beforehand just to get us all checked off to make sure that we were okay. And then on board, uh, pretty much every second day, we would all take our temperature and record it just to keep on top of it, just in case. Um, we did have isolation procedures on board just in case someone did uh, have it, which we were all fine, but we had all come from different parts of the world, so we needed to make sure that we were safe <laughs> but essentially we had our own three-week isolation on board anyway so by the time we got to Tahiti we knew we were safe but it was more um other people coming near us that we were kind of telling to back off so um yeah I mean it wasn't it wasn't unsafe or un we weren't unprepared to leave on our voyage it was more just making sure we could get into French Polynesia and then um what would happen after that and this is obviously a huge global expedition. I can't recall exactly how many legs and how many incredible women had signed up to be involved. Uh, what does it mean for the expedition um, crew now? Yeah, so X Expedition was 30 legs, 300 women around the world, starting in Plymouth in the UK and ending in Plymouth two years later. Uh, mine was leg eight, so the, you know, um, the first year into the voyage, essentially. But X Expedition has um, been put on hold for a year now. Um, with all the borders closed down, the boat and the skipper and first mate are still in Tahiti at the moment. Um, and so we just need to work out how or when or where the boat is going to go for the next year. But essentially the trip will pick up in a year's time from Tahiti with the women that were supposed to be on the next leg to the Cook Islands and then continue from there. So instead of two years, it'll take three years, but um, it'll still get done and all that great science will still come out uh, from around the world around microfibers and microplastics, which is excellent. And I'm glad that it can still keep going. Let's talk a little bit more about it because it's not the first um, all-female expedition you've gone on as well. You've been down to Antarctica with an all-female crew. Um, tell us what it's like, obviously, the experience of going on these incredible adventures, but also uh, the climate around working with these all-female crews. Yeah, I um I have been on a few all female voyages. The first one was to Antarctica with Homeward Bound Project, and they were you know eighty female scientists, all of us in Antarctica for um a month, which was pretty incredible. And then this one as well, um so fourteen of us from all around the world with all different backgrounds. So not everyone was a scientist. Um, on our trip, we had anthropologists, paramedics, filmmakers, um, people that work in waste management, essentially, and nuclear waste. And yeah, we were all came, we've all come from different backgrounds. It was great writers as well. So the fact that we could all bring our knowledge and passions for the ocean or the things that we really love and harness those superpowers, I guess, um, on board and then take the messages of what we've learned away was really quite powerful for our trip. Um, and it was a great learning curve to learn off all these other women and the spaces where they've come from and what they really do in their own communities to highlight plastic pollution um, and what they're thinking about doing going forward now that they've been on this incredible journey and actually done and like, you know, have their hands dirty with the science too. So it's, um, it's a really beautiful melting pot of individuals and I think it's um it's a really special um space to be in actually because women uh when they're alone I said essentially without the opposite sex really do act in a different way essentially and I feel like they can be a lot more themselves and a lot more comfortable and open up a lot more so it was um it's a really really nice space to be in really comfortable and relaxed and um everyone essentially is themselves so it's it's a great space to to see and interact with. Well, I hope we can come back to, to this sort of subject a bit more throughout the podcast because you are an incredible role model to, I'm sure, many women around the world and many young girls too, but to, to many people broadly. So let's let's talk a little bit more about you. I mean, if we go to your website, we learn that you're a presenter, model, environmentalist, you hold multiple degrees and are still studying, but maybe you can tell the listeners a little bit about you and how it is that you came to, to be in the position you are uh, in 2020 and, uh, and, and, and what that means for you to be doing what you do. Yeah, well, I um, I grew up in Sydney and um, spent a lot of time at the beach and in the national park as a kid and played a lot of sport. And when I was at school, I knew that I really enjoyed science and I loved biology and I really wanted to be a scientist um, and go to university. So I started uni and ended up studying marine biology and law and then knew that 
law wasn't really for me. Uh, as much as I wanted to practice law of the sea, I knew that I couldn't really uh, kind of get my hands dirty enough in that space. And um, I went on to get a few jobs as an environmental scientist and for different areas. But in the midst of all of that craziness and going through university, I uh, got scouted as um, a curvy model, which was something that was never, ever intended or never a job that I would never have thought that I could do. Um, you know, that I just wanted to be a scientist. I was happy to wear a lab coat and weird goggles and, you know, cut things up. Um, <laughs> so for me, fashion wasn't really the plan. But I um, I gave it a go and it kind of just took off after a while. And I guess I can credit the, the modelling industry with helping me to identify with myself and also um, have a great acceptance of my body because beforehand I was never – I never really thought about it. I um, – yeah, I, I wouldn't say that I was happy or unhappy with my body. It was just what it was. And now um, having been in the industry for such a long time and accepting who I am and what I am and what my body looks like and what it does has been really positive and powerful because that's allowed me to go on to do the things that I really love and really cherish now without thinking about how I look or what other people think about me. So um, the modelling industry um, – it was a big step and a big risk, but I gave it a go and I moved to New York and uh, worked as a model for a long time over there and then eventually moved back to Australia. And I still model now. I've been living back in Australia for eight years. And uh, when I first got back to Australia, though, I knew that I really wanted to get back into the science and the environment and do the things that I was really passionate about because um, I couldn't just continue to be a model um, because it didn't really fulfill my soul as such. And then, so the way it came about was someone put me in contact with you. <laughs> <laughs> Tim Silverwood. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, we met and then went from there with the Boomerang Alliance. And then it kind of just, I was happy to throw myself at things and volunteer, which, you know, as the environmental industry is very much about, um, <laughs> there's a lot of volunteering opportunities and, yeah, went from campaign to campaign and, and found the things that I was really passionate about. And that is ocean conservation, um, being uh, with a background in marine biology and um, centred around that and marine plastic pollution and climate change and then you know, sustainability in general and around fashion as well, bringing that those two sides of my life essentially together. Um, now working as a science communicator and it's it's been a very big whirlwind and a big spiral of a career and I'm still on that spiral and whirlwind and I'm liking where it's going um, because it allows me to educate so many people in a space that I really would like to see change. Yeah, and that's another theme I think we could we could both talk about and flesh out further as well there is just how much the landscape has transformed in making opportunities for people like yourself and many others now who now, they don't necessarily fit the archetype of this traditional uh, activist or advocate or campaigner, but they've got a unique skill set or a unique quality about them that allows them to, to play their part in this very now broad conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, maybe let's talk a little bit more about that, how you've seen in the time since you sort of took those first steps into saying, well, you know what, I'd like to continue with my modeling work and my um and and that side of my career but I really 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 want to focus on my passions which is is the environment so what have you seen change since those early days to now and, and where do you therefore see it might be heading next yeah I guess back then I um assumed an advocate or a campaigner had a, a particular stereotype that I didn't really fit into uh, but once I was open up to that space, I realised that everyone was just like me and everyone was passionate and they all came from different walks of life. And it was really encouraging to see that you didn't have to be a scientist or you didn't have to be an economist or, or no political science. It was you just had to be passionate about it and, and really want to help. So that, um, that definitely opened my eyes up to that volunteering campaigning space where um, – I was happy to be in because I've, I've now met some of my best friends in that space, which is unreal. And um, now we get to work on these great campaigns together, which is fantastic. So I think that broadened my scope up to going, oh, no, I'm happy to keep doing this and I'm happy to work on other campaigns as well. And it um, by doing that, it just 
it really expanded my knowledge base on what's happening in the world, uh, not just localised to myself, but globally um, in this environmental world and and how we can tackle it um, and the fact that we actually need everyone. <laughs> we, we need all those different walks of life. We need the volunteers. We need the economists. We need the people in finance and politics to really all step up and play their part. So I, I think the interconnectedness of people and the environment really came into play for me. Um, and knowing that within this space, I have a voice and the person next to me has a voice and that person has a voice uh, and that they all have their sphere of influence that they can talk to. Um, so for me, I think one of the biggest things I learned was what you do matters. Every single, um, everything you pick up or everything you buy, someone's watching you do that and you can set an example by doing um, something really positive without even talking as well. And I think that's the way I've kind of tried to live my life now and especially in work as well, just realise that, no, people are watching and people are listening and, and people are hungry for knowledge, so let's give it to them in the best way that you can. And it doesn't mean you have to be preaching or be that stereotypical campaigner. You can just be yourself and do it and make a, a re and have a really big impact. So it's been um, it's been a really beautiful journey, actually, through the environmental space to one of, I guess, um, self-fulfillment, but also enjoyment and awakening, knowing that, you know, you can ha make a really big difference in a very small way. Mm. I wonder, um, my mind was drifting during that response there, that exchange about, you know, the parts of your career when you were viewed, I guess, as a model first and foremost. And now I wonder what that portion of, of your audience and those people who recognise and acknowledge you um, consider you an environmentalist first, because I think you've really done a fantastic job of, um, of, of changing that hat, I suppose, and still wearing both, but just really representing and really standing for something. And I think the other thing that I wanted to sort of reiterate there from that exchange is just that how well you do communications and you seem to do it so seamlessly. I think a lot of people, they want to be able to be a voice and to maybe increase the ability for them to speak to their sphere of influence, but they're really intimidated, I suppose, by the tools that you need to know um, to do communications well. I, is it just a natural um, skill of yours that you do communication so well, or, or what would you say to people who maybe uh, need a little bit of help or confidence there around how to use these tools? Yeah, no, I don't think it was a natural um, skill. I think it was something that I've learnt along the way, but not not the skill of communication. It's more just the I've learnt the fact that if you just do it, people will listen and it doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, I think that was one of the things that stopped me at the beginning was the fact that I always want it to be perfect and, you know, I felt like I needed to have an external videographer to do it and, and the sound had to be perfect. It had to be edited. But people don't really care. They're just hungry for the knowledge. And if they relate to you, um, then they will listen. And, you know, if you're not finger pointing and being angry uh, and you're giving them positive steps and positive solutions and opening up a dialogue where they can see themselves in that space, then that's um, that's kind of what I aim for. And I feel like that's been the most effective. Um, you know, we all see ourselves in different people when we we're not all going to look at the to the same person uh, for the same information unless it's David Attenborough so uh, we need multiple people out there on the same bandwagon doing their thing in different ways for a great like you know to grow the choir even bigger because if we keep preaching to the same people then we're not educating a bigger space that's right I mean we know how damaging a, a monoculture is in nature. Um, yeah. Nature survives and thrives on diversity. So I'm I'm right with you there on that. Um, so, yeah, I think one thing I wanted to talk about as well, just to sort of keep on this same um, tangent, was obviously those early days. And I'd be surprised if it wasn't, you know, 2013 or something around that time when we first connected and, and started to collaborate on some of those campaigns like... Um, containers for um, 10 cent recycling scheme, cash for containers. Uh, what does it feel like that this plastics issue has, has become so mainstream now? Does, does it surprise you? Like give us a bit of your feeling about how you've seen these issues around plastics and waste and circularity and zero waste living 
how it's seen um, that they've become so mainstream? Yeah, I, it's fantastic. I mean, it's really exciting to see that exponential growth in awareness and education and people jumping on board just even in the last couple of years. I mean, my first foray, I guess, into plastic pollution was when I was living in New York and I was traveling a lot and I started to see all of this plastic pollution, especially in the Caribbean islands when I was going down there for photo shoots. And I was really shocked by it. And that's when I started understanding it and, and researching and, and seeing what was going on. Um, and then really realizing what my own footprint of plastic was, especially living in New York. It's, um, it's disgusting actually over there, how much plastic is used every day, especially single use. So uh, that's when I started, you know, learning and educating myself. And then in Australia when I moved back in year 2012 and, and met you and then container deposits and seeing that and and seeing how many people were educated was great but then that campaigning side really opened my eyes up to the fact that wow actually there's a huge task ahead of us um, to get people up to speed about what's going on and and why they need to you know reduce their plastic consumption and why we need 10 cent um, container deposit and um, so going from those early days to, you know, now eight years later and being constantly bombarded by people online sharing, you know, um, things about plastic waste or just seeing these people outdoors, just, they'll just pick things up now. And it's, it's really encouraging, um, seeing all the businesses that are offering discounts for, uh, people bringing their own. And yeah, I think, um, it's, it's really, really encouraging for the future to see that happening. Um, but then there's a couple of roadblocks that we're still hitting. And one of them I'm noticing right now is this pandemic <laughs> because I am drowning in single use plastic in this hotel room and I can't do anything about it. <laughs> yeah, it is a, it is a tough one. And obviously very hard to even try and have a conversation about that at this point in time, because our priorities are so squarely fixed mm -hmm. on containing the virus. But I guess um, sort of where I'm coming from at the moment, and, and, and maybe you feel same, the same way, is that with this mainstream mass awareness on issues like plastic pollution, it does mean that we've got people's hearts and minds fully attuned to this problem. And so the next step then is, OK, well, if you've got the hearts and minds one, then how does that cascade to see the, ch the change that we want to see in the world. Mm -hmm. So what are you picking up and seeing? How have you seen brands or policies being, um, you know, introduced, new ways of doing things in light of consumers being so ready to um, to embrace the change? Yeah, I think all that, that vocal, um, vocalness, I guess, from the consumers for change has encouraged a lot of entrepreneurship, um, especially from businesses either changing their policies and bringing in uh, you know, I mean, if we look at the supermarkets, for example, with plastic bags and you, and you go to Harris Farm and they went, no, we're not going to have plastic bags. We'll just do paper bags now. Um, and that's in light of people asking for it. You know, it wouldn't have changed had no one stood up and said, we want this now, um, which I think is really encouraging. And it sets a great example for other businesses to do the same thing. Um, same with things like responsible cafes, you know, these little um, innovations and and groups of people that want to make change and then they facilitate the coffee shops making change and just make it easy for them to transition to something like that and give them all the um, you know the paraphernalia and everything that they need to actually just go in there and implement it straight away and it doesn't change their business as usual but it encourages people to go there and, and it encourages conversations and education um, and then, you know, you go to businesses like Atik, which is one of my favourites. They um, they do shampoo and body bars and everything, and they're completely plastic free. They make shampoo um, bars and conditioner bars and almost any sort of beauty product you can think of. And all their packaging is compostable as well. So you end up with nothing at the end of the day. And it's, you know, those entrepreneurial people like that, that really kind of foster the revolution and other businesses to to follow in that footsteps too, um, which I think is so encouraging. And I'm, I'm loving, you know, working with some of these brands at the moment because of the fact that they are just quite inspiring people. And 
they're there to really make a difference. It's not about them and it's not about the money as such, even though they are a business. The reason that a lot of them were actually created came out of a necessity because they thought, you know, I don't want to be using this plastic and I don't want this footprint and I don't want to have to put this thing in my garbage bin because it can't be recycled, but there's got to be a better solution. And then they've gone out there and done it and, you know, made it available on mass to the world, which is really great. Um, and I think that those start, those sorts of companies and businesses are starting to catch on now. And it's not the fact that people are thinking, oh, I've got to make money. It's like, no, let's, let's actually find a better product to make the world a better place and, and get people thinking about this. And, and then once people find those products, they move on to something else in their life too, which is really great. So it's encouraging people to be better throughout their life not just using one different product yeah and i think at the moment um given the amount of people around the world that have been sort of forced into this lockdown and isolation creativity must be just spawning all around our planet um whether that's following some online tutorials and how to make your own bread or i know i'm getting low on on deodorant and i've got a lovely little balm deodorant i'm like well i'm gonna have to probably make that now myself and so the creativity and that sort of innovation piece i think is ready to go so have you sort of been lending your mind yet to sort of viewing um what i was calling this sort of great disruption or the first of many great disruptions other people are calling it the great pause as we sort mm -hmm. of stop and reassess and stock take on the way we're doing things are you letting your your mind already start to think about how this could be harnessed for the greater good of, of our species and our beautiful planet yeah, definitely. I actually think this is a really positive time as much as it is very disruptive because it's allowing people to see what they really cherish and what they really need or don't need because a lot of people are you know, stopping what they thought was essential in their life. They're not getting that anymore. So not only are they probably saving money, they're reducing waste at the same time, but really understanding, oh, well, maybe when it goes back to normal, what is my normal and what do I want my normal to be? Um, because, you know, for me, I know that being locked in this room, it's really highlighted how much I love to be outside <laughs> um, and just have fresh air and be able to walk as well. Um, you know, I just really haven't been able to to walk. I have, you know, I can walk from one end to the other in 12 steps. So um, that for me, really highlights the fact that no I, I'm on the right path of what I'm doing because I want to be outside because it gives me so much um, in so many areas of my life that I need to protect that and and look after it but also I don't need anything else but just to go outside right now as long as I've got a bit of food and uh, my health and being outside then okay well I don't really need that much else um, so I think this will really open people's eyes to taking note of what they do, what they need, and moving forward, hopefully they can continue to reduce that. And whether it be out of ambition to save money and, you know, have put more money in their wallet or whether it be out of ambition to be like, no, this is, you know, how I want to live my life now and I can do it. I've been forced to do it, so I know I can. Um or because they really understand how important our planet is and how globalised we are and how interconnected we are, then I don't think it matters how they got to that thought. It just matters that they go forward and be better. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's certainly, um, you know, whether those businesses that were thriving before this point in time whether they like it or not, they are going to be entering um, a, a market which is completely transformed. And it, it may be that it it bounces back. It's highly sort of, um, you know, springy and it, and, it, and it tries its best to get back into the shape that it was. But I think uh, most people out there who I'm seeing communicating about it are recognising that it, it will be quite radically different. And, and you know, just to talk a little bit about, I guess, where my head is at and with Ocean Impact Organisation, it certainly feels the same way. Obviously, we're very acutely aware of how damaging and disrupting this is, and that there's a, a lot of disparity in how people are affected. And we can, you know, people can argue that we're speaking from a point of great privilege by able to look at it through these rose-coloured lenses. But you know, the the world needed something to jolt itself 
out of this um, this vicious trajectory that we were on. And I suppose those of us working in climate change in the environment space uh, naturally expected this high level disruption would come from some sort of planetary retaliation in a different way. And it turns out it's come from this very much um, invisible enemy. So I love that in that way, we're all rallying around a, a common enemy, but it's causing um, this, this disruption. Yeah, I definitely agree. And even though, you know, I look at it as a positive for us moving forward, it still like has affected me in a lot of different ways. And going forward, I don't know, you know, I don't know where I'll be making money from in the, in the, in the short term. So I think, you know, as much as people think of this as a good thing, there's still lots of things in the background that will be affecting them as well. Um, and that we just kind of, it's a really a great time for compassion right now. Um, compassion for everything, which is, you know, Hopefully that will filter on and keep going into the future too. Mm. You've got your little sailboat. Is that is that a, is that an opportunity for you to go and uh, if you if you've got if no works coming in, you might just go and jump on the sailboat for a little um, while. How are your plans that, affected there? <laughs> yeah, that would be lovely. Um, we did uh, buy a sailboat just recently, so um, yeah. I mean, if there's, I've still got to find a way to make money. <laughs> Uh, being a freelancer is hard in this world when there's uh, no work to be done. But um, yeah, that jumping on the sailing boat and maybe taking a week or two out is um, is actually an option for us at the moment. So we'll see what happens. Um, but it's over in Western Australia, so I still need to get there, and I might need to quarantine when I get there. So uh, I don't Doesn't know. After this, feeling, does it? No, after <laughs> this uh, doubt of 14 days in this hotel, I think I'm done with quarantine for a while. <laughs> Yeah. I guess um, on that note of freelancing and obviously the, the hit that your industry and many, many others um, are taking right now, you know, we, I suppose we, we hope that on the other side is a, is a flurry of activity for, for those brands and businesses that are positioned to do good, um, to contribute to the future that we all want to see. So maybe just a little bit of a glimpse from you into what you've been seeing in recent years um, in terms of even just the the opportunities that are coming your way to, to model or to or to communicate about brands are you just seeing more and more that are fitting that uh, that model of, of being regenerative restorative trying to give back and, and all of that yeah definitely that has been um, an exponential increase in the last probably three years I think uh, I've been modeling for around 13 years now and yeah it's never have I seen such an increase in sustain like sustainability and it and I guess eco brands and that can definitely be greenwashed on a lot of brands but there are actually brands out there that are doing ethical sustainable manufacturing um, of garments which is incredible or um, other products as well and are taking it to the next level they don't just slap on a label and say hey my my business is sustainable well you know, I question a lot of businesses that I work with about, well, why are you sustainable or why are you ethical? Can you prove it? Where's the transparency? And there are so many more brands out there that are um, getting on board with that now and understanding why it's so important to treat their workers fairly, pay them, um, you know, above minimum wage, pay them a living wage and use materials that are favourable to an actual sustainable future and not just something that will end up in landfill. So um, it's been really positive in that space. And to talk to people that are doing it for the right reasons as well, is that's another um, real tick in the box, I think. You know, there are so many brands out there that just start up out of nothing with no intention other than to make cheap clothes that will put a lot of money in their pockets. But the people that are really coming and, and being born out of being enlightened by the fact that they want to keep their world sustainable and that they can do a better job at what other brands are doing, then, um, yeah, it's really positive and just lots of really young entrepreneurs out there that really want to make a difference going forward. So I'm really positive about that space, actually. Yeah, excellent. Well, well me too, and I think we just need to be providing uh, all the tools that we can to, to help the great innovators and, and those that want to create the right kind of disruption in the future to those you know, the business as usual model, which has sort of got us into a, a pretty serious predicament. So I am with you on that. 
Okay, well, um, I think we've had a, a wonderful conversation and we really appreciate you being able to speak to us from this very unique circumstances mm -hmm. you find yourself in. Um, I'd love just to sort of spend this last little exchange um, just going a little bit back into nature, whether that's you reflecting on an experience that you had during the recent um, X expedition voyage or maybe it's about that place that you know you really want to go once you finally escape the clutches of that hotel room. <laughs> Tell us a little bit more about just where you want to find your heart in, in nature and, or in the ocean right about now or on yeah. Monday. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, well, my happy place is definitely getting salty, being submerged, uh, whether that be snorkeling or scuba diving or on top of the water in a, on a surfboard. But I love to watch ecosystem interactions and whether that be little fish, you know, uh, nibbling on coral or it be looking into the eye of a humpback whale those are the things that really make my soul sing and give me the um, ambition and courage even to continue to do what I do so for me um, I am really looking forward to getting back to the Great Barrier Reef um, one because it is just uh, essentially gone through a third huge mass bleaching um, in the last couple of uh, weeks and I want to get up there and see what's happening but also go back to some of my favorite places and make sure that they're okay and um, to my second trip that I'm really looking forward to hopefully after all of this uh, COVID is over is uh, I'm going back to Tonga in September um, to take people swimming with humpback whales and teach them about conservation and and whales as well so uh, I'm really really looking forward to getting back there and um seeing all of my Tongan friends and going snorkeling and spending time with these incredible charismatic megafauna of our ocean because they're the ones that, you know, keep me going and um, make me realise that the world is not just about humans, it's about all of us and we all need to work together um, to keep it safe and healthy for future generations of humans and other species too. So, that's kind of where I'm looking forward to. My hope is going forward to the Great Barrier Reef and to Tonga for the rest of the year, I think. <laughs> I love it. We'll, um, we'll, we'll go along with you as we follow your journey. Um, on that note, maybe give us a, some final parting words and tell those listeners where they can, um, t where they can communicate with you and, and follow your journey. Oh, sure. The best place I would say to jump on board with me is on Instagram. It's... Um, I am at I am Laura Wells and same on Facebook as well. That's kind of where I try to document my journeys and also, you know, shed a bit of science communication on all the fun things that I do and also, you know, help with solutions and open up that dialogue because I love to have debates and chats with people about what they're doing to make the world a better place too. So, um, yeah, if anyone wants to throw me a line and let me know what they're doing, I'm totally up for it. <laughs> And you'll have a good time. You're throwing a nice little bit of geekiness and nerdiness in there too, oh, yeah. don't you? Of course. You don't take yourself too seriously. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> Thanks so much, Laura. I love being able to call you a friend and ally in this fight and um, really thank you for your time. Yeah, thanks, Tim. And I can't wait to see what Ocean Impact gets up to. Lots. <laughs> yes, excellent. <laughs> see you, mate. See ya. Bye.